Okay, good morning. How's everyone doing? Good. We find Tuesday mornings are very similar to Monday mornings around here. It takes everyone a little bit of a couple of minutes to get uh, get set up. Uh, my name is Sarah Ladislaw uh, at the, uh, oh, close laptop. Excuse me. Hi, my name is Sarah Ladislaw. I'm a senior fellow here in the Energy and National Security Program, and apparently I'm a little short. Um, I wanted to welcome all of you here today for uh, this really exciting event uh, called High Impact Energy Efficiency. Um, for us, it's a, it's a big deal because it's the first in a series that we're starting uh, this year on the geopolitics of clean energy. Um, in cooperation with uh, CSIS, we're working with the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy Analysis uh, and our good friend who's the director of that program, uh, Doug Arendt, will be moderating the panel this afternoon. Um, we chose to focus on the geopolitics of clean energy um, because given the really important and growing role that clean energy sources are having in, global energy in the global energy mix, uh, we thought it was interesting to look at what the geopolitical dynamics were uh, of those changes in different uh, parts of the world, um, looking at issues like competition and trade, uh, things like technology barriers uh, and uh, some of the policies and even some of the definitions for what different countries think about clean energy. And so to start off, we, we, uh, we started with uh, what is probably the toughest, uh, the, the, well, I guess the easiest tough choice uh, when it comes to clean energy, which is uh, energy efficiency. It's easy because everyone agrees that energy efficiency is a good uh, answer for our economic or security or environmental concerns. It's tough because it's really hard to sort of catalyze energy efficiency gains uh, in all the segments of the economy and all the sectors uh, of the world uh, that are interested in realizing those gains. So what we wanted to do was take this opportunity today um, at the confluence of a few major events that are coming up in the next couple weeks. They're going to focus on new ways to really uh, catalyze uh, differences and changes uh, in, uh, in energy efficiency gains. And so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to focus on uh, 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 one particular event, the Clean Energy Ministerial, uh, that the that uh, the Department of Energy is uh, is hosting with a, a series of other countries, uh, that's coming up in the next couple weeks, and then also the E and E Global. Uh, event that's going to be happening the week after. Uh, and so today to sort of talk about uh, what's going on both in terms of energy efficiency uh, for the Clean Energy Ministerial but then also some of the other events, uh, we've got Rick Duke who is the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Climate Change Policy from the U.S. Department of Energy uh, and then Kateri Callahan to talk about uh, energy efficiency uh, from a global perspective, what's going on uh, in different parts of the world uh, to sort of bring us a little bit closer to the energy efficiency issue. Uh, Kateri is the President uh, of the Alliance to Save Energy, which is uh, 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 certainly one of the uh, leading uh, groups on energy efficiency in this country and, and increasingly around the world. Uh, and so we're going to have uh, these uh, two distinguished speakers sort of set the scene for a panel discussion that we'll have on some of the specific initiatives uh, and things going on uh, around the world in terms of really kind of trying to reach those high impact energy efficiency gains. Uh, so I would like to start by inviting Rick Duke uh, to talk about the Clean Energy Ministerial. Thank you, Sarah. And let me start by thanking the uh, CSIS for uh, organizing this event and the whole series that you have in front of you. Uh, very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today. Um, I'll start with a bit of context on the Clean Energy Ministerial to give you a sense of how it fits in uh, to the last couple of years of uh, climate and clean energy history uh, and a little sense of how it fits in with the, um, some of the other fora that uh, you're familiar with. Um, and, and I think the first point to make is that this is something which leaders, uh, both President Obama and his counterparts in other major economies, uh, have called for. They've called for their energy ministers to work together on what is a core agenda for uh, all of these governments, which is finding a way to drive energy efficiency uh, and clean energy progress, uh, both through ambitious domestic action that's informed by international experience, as well as through international cooperation, uh, where there are opportunities to move faster through international cooperation and coordination. Uh, and this dates back to July of 2009, uh, in the Laocula uh, Declaration, where leaders called for a global partnership to address these challenges. And out of that came a set of technology action plans uh, that included a, a series of recommendations that we're now uh, working to carry forward through the Clean Energy Ministerial Dialogue. And I'll tell you a bit about that uh, as I go forward. Uh, later, Graham Pugh from our team will uh, give you more detail when he's on the panel uh, on some of the initiatives, in particular in the efficiency area. 
Uh, and I'll just mention that the G20 has reaffirmed uh, this leader-level interest in the Clean Energy Ministerial Dialogue uh, as recently as last November. <coughs> Uh, in terms of uh, other processes, uh, of course, the Framework Convention uh, is uh, continuing to move ahead uh, with its efforts uh, through the Copenhagen Accord and, and then on into the uh, uh, Cancun uh, outcome. And, uh, and I think that the key point here is that uh, the major economies represented in uh, the Clean Energy Ministerial Dialogue uh, represent a big share of the uh, opportunity for deploying efficiency and clean energy. Uh, so as such, they uh, have uh, a central role in trying to address this problem globally. Other than that, there is no direct relationship between the Clean Energy Ministerial Dialogue and the UNFCCC negotiations. Uh, and I think in, in many respects that gives us uh, uh, far more flexibility and, and a, uh, a smaller and more uh, dynamic uh, negotiating, or it's really not a negotiating context, uh, discussion context, an opportunity to focus on actions among governments that want to move forward uh, on clean energy and efficiency. Uh, and we hope that all that is supportive of the broader aims uh, represented in the Framework Convention negotiations. With respect to the uh, uh, institutions listed here, the International Energy Agency, the International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation, uh, and the International Renewable Energy Association, uh, these are examples of the kinds of existing technical institutions that the Clean Energy Ministerial aims to bolster through a political level dialogue. And the idea is simply that uh, by having energy ministers meet, uh, and uh, take a close look at what can be done to drive faster progress on efficiency and broader clean energy topics, uh, we can create political momentum uh, for these, uh, that empowers these existing institutions, uh, takes advantage of the technical work that they're doing, uh, and also, quite frankly, uh, gives some impetus to the staffs and the, and the respective bureaucracies that are driving ahead on nitty-gritty technical challenges like minimum standards for appliances or establishing the right kind of rules to integrate re uh, renewables into the grid uh, and what have you. So. Uh, the key point on this slide is, is uh, quite clear. You've got uh, the major economies all represented in this dialogue, a few other leading governments that have uh, strong equities in clean energy and, and have shown leadership uh, through this dialogue and, and more broadly. And, and that means that with a small group of uh, some 24 governments, you're able to have a discussion that represents uh, the lion's share of the market and try to move things uh, through that dialogue. This kicked off last July here in Washington. Secretary Chu uh, convened uh, 24 governments and uh, had what uh, was in many respects, uh, we think, an extraordinary start to this, uh, to this discussion. Uh, there was a uh, public forum that was very well attended here in, in D.C. and then, uh, most importantly for us, uh, a, uh, an extremely dynamic and, um, and, and positive uh, dialogue among the ministers themselves and a series of uh, initiatives were launched that I'll go into in some depth here in a moment. And again, uh, Graham will echo that and, and go deeper in the panel discussion. The next such meeting is happening in a couple of weeks in UAE. Uh, and uh, the agenda uh, for this meeting will include uh, a clear focus on what uh, national policies can do to drive energy efficiency and clean energy. Uh, and it will also look at what we can do to better allocate uh, increasingly scarce public dollars uh, to drive uh, the same kinds of, of clean energy success. Uh, and, and we expect to uh, kick off a series of um, engagements with uh, the private sector and the nonprofit sector in high-level roundtables uh, that we think will begin an extended conversation about these same topics uh, with those key stakeholders. So let me tell you a little bit about the kind of underpinnings of the, uh, of the overall um, dialogue, and I did not realize this was animated, but we'll get there. Uh, so on the uh, uh, these, these are sort of the core principles that Secretary Chu has laid out uh, for this overall uh, discussion. And, and I think that they are important because they help to distinguish this from other existing uh, 
uh, fora. And, and I think that they're uh, what, what we hope will be a secret to success uh, over time uh, in this effort. And, and I think the first is that we're really focused on results here. And, and the Secretary himself has uh, said uh, from the beginning that he uh, only wants to make time for this if there's uh, a clear line from uh, the discussion to some kind of concrete impact uh, in areas that he cares about passionately, like appliance efficiency uh, or smart grid technologies and the like. Uh, and, and again, I think we are uh, getting down that path, and I'll, I'll talk about some specifics in a moment moment. To get there, this requires that all the governments involved be actively engaged in what we've been calling a distributed leadership model, which means that it's not uh, an American initiative per se, it's uh, a major economies initiative, it's an opportunity for all the participating governments uh, to work together in flexible coalitions uh, on topics where they have particular, uh, particular equities and, and opportunities to lead. Um, and this also means that there's no particular need to negotiate uh, any uh, text or, or, or have any kind of a, a formal communique from the meetings. Uh, and, and this is, in, in our minds, uh, an advantage because it means that we don't have to have uh, a sort of least common denominator outcome, but rather we can look for uh, opportunities to move ahead ambitiously uh, among the subsets of participating governments that want to do so. Um, and so uh, the last bullet is, is, speaks for itself, I think. In terms of um, accomplishments to date, Lots of great animation there. We've got uh, a, uh, a set of initiatives that were launched uh, last July. And, uh, and, and I think importantly with those initiatives came some concrete targets uh, that we're now uh, actively moving ahead to try to realize. Um, I think the most ambitious of the targets is the goal to avoid 500 mid-sized power plants over the next 20 years uh, with the, the, the efforts of the ministerial. Uh, on that note, we've already started to track the kinds of uh, impact that uh, participating governments are having through mechanisms like appliance efficiency. Uh, and, and I'm pleased to say that even uh, since this effort began, there have been dozens of power plants avoided through uh, minimum standards work and other kinds of appliance efficiency policies uh, initiated by the participating governments. Uh, this will take time for these, uh, of course, uh, these benefits to be realized in the marketplace, but the rules have been put in place, the progress is being made, uh, and we want to encourage and empower uh, participating governments to do much more of those kinds of transformative uh, energy efficiency and, and, and clean energy policies. Um, there's a second sub-dash there uh, in the area of energy access, and, and I'll talk a little bit about an initiative that specifically addresses an opportunity for what is really uh, high efficiency um, and clean off-grid uh, uh, lighting appliances. Um, and then we've been focusing on some of the clean supply challenges and uh, an initiative to help uh, encourage leadership by uh, women in the clean energy field. Uh, and I think the key point um, that's really perhaps best represented on this slide is that, and you can't really see it, but uh, this matrix here shows the set of 11 initiatives against the 24 governments uh, and the dots representing participation. I think the key point is that there are a lot of dots, but of course it's not a complete chessboard. Uh, and that's entirely appropriate in our view. Uh, it fits with the distributed leadership model that we're trying to encourage. Uh, and we don't expect uh, or require in any sense that all governments participate in all of these initiatives. Rather, we want active participation in those initiatives that governments choose to involve themselves in. Uh, and broadly, we've grouped these uh, initiatives into a set of energy efficiency efforts, some clean supply efforts, uh, and then some cross-cutting uh, initiatives as well. I'll talk about one and to some extent three uh, in, our, in my uh, remarks this morning. Starting with a core initiative and a probably familiar chart, uh, this is certainly something that Secretary Chu uh, likes to show frequently, um, and it's because it's a, it's a compelling story, which is basically that uh, when you look at the history of refrigerators in the, uh, in the U.S. context, you see a dramatic improvement in the cost uh, per refrigeration service unit, in, in effect, uh, starting when appliance standards uh, became active in the refrigerator area. And then importantly, those, uh, that progress has continued uh, to this day, and, and we see prospects for it to continue uh, well into the future in this one important product category. So even as the size of the, uh, of the units has gone up, the costs have come down, and the energy efficiency has improved, uh, and, and minimum standards have been a, a huge part of driving that success uh, in our estimation. The Super Efficient Equipment and Appliances Deployment Initiative aims to encourage much more of this kind of outcome uh, more globally. 
And, and I mention globally because in many cases, appliances are effectively global commodities. You look at something like uh, televisions, and they're basically identical in all markets. And so there are major opportunities uh, for governments to borrow from the same technical analysis when setting their own minimum standards, uh, or to uh, borrow from the same playbook when looking at incentives for very high efficiency televisions, uh, and to work together on, uh, on uh, other joint uh, challenges that involve raising uh, the, the ceiling and, and looking for the very best uh, uh, televisions or refrigerators or other appliances to enter the marketplace more quickly, uh, and then clipping off the worst performers uh, by setting minimum standards and driving the kind of progress that you see here uh, in the case of the, uh, of the refrigerator market in the U.S. Again, uh, dozens of uh, power plants already uh, avoided by rules uh, that have been initiated in the, or, or, excuse me, completed in the last year uh, by participating governments. That will take decades to have that impact realized, but the rules have been achieved. Uh, and then uh, much more to come and, and seed this initiative for the ministerial um, is already starting to have impact. Um, one of the participating governments has already used some of the related technical analysis to inform its LED standard, uh, and there's uh, much more of that kind of momentum building in, in a series of active work groups in this initiative. Briefly, uh, on, a, on a second efficiency-related initiative, um, this is the uh, Global, Superior, Global Superior Energy Performance Partnership. Um, key on the right-hand side of this page is the 11 marquee uh, companies that have agreed to pilot the approach. Uh, and the basic idea is that in large industrial uh, factories, as well as in large uh, commercial facilities, uh, there are opportunities for those managing those facilities uh, to do a better job on driving efficiency gains over time if they, if they measure more effectively how they're doing uh, and if they benchmark. And so this is a uh, certification program, or really a network of national certification programs that are unfolding, building on the ISO 50001 standard, um, and we are are uh, excited to work with these uh, with these companies, including a couple in India that you'll see uh, on on helping to make uh, this change happen. Uh, you'll also note that there's a set of uh, sector-specific working groups represented here, uh, and these are. Um, going to be carrying forward some of the uh, excellent work initiated under the Asia-Pacific Partnership and now with a broader scope that includes uh, the full range of major economies represented in this dialogue. Um, and I'll move on to talk a bit about uh, electric vehicles. Uh, in the electric vehicles initiative, uh, this is importantly something that was actually brought forward uh, as an idea by China. Uh, and we have worked with them on uh, bolstering the initiative and implementing it um, and set a robust, uh, robust goal uh, to encourage all the participating governments to hit their own self-announced uh, and, and really pre-announced um, goals for electric vehicle deployment in such a way that by 2020 uh, we would see 20 million electric vehicles on the road uh, among the participating governments. And there's a whole range of ways that uh, we can work together on this, including uh, looking for key gaps in public R&D investment in technologies like batteries uh, and sharing experience with what it takes to create uh, the infrastructure uh, for deploying uh, electric vehicles at scale. Just touch briefly on another uh, initiative with even better animation. Uh, the, uh, the Smart Grid uh, Action Network uh, is a, a, actually a new technical institution uh, like the International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation, or IRENA, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in this case, uh, it will be uh, launched in, in uh, just a couple of weeks in Abu Dhabi as an implementing agreement uh, within the uh, International Energy Agency um, uh, structure uh, institutionally, and, uh, and it will be um, carrying forward one of those technology action plans that I mentioned earlier. A central recommendation uh, of the Smart Grid Technology Action Plan was to create an opportunity for governments to work together uh, on this suite of uh, emerging technologies that are so critical for both efficiency and uh, clean energy integration. Uh, and so we've worked with uh, partner governments, in particular uh, Korea and Italy, uh, but also now with broad participation. I think at last count we were at something like 19 governments uh, that are participating in this initiative. Uh, and we've uh, gotten to the point now where we can uh, launch and get to work on an agenda that includes a whole range of important uh, topics where, where some joint work on uh, simple uh, questions like 
understanding what's happening uh, among participating governments in this space uh, so that uh, you have transparency about who's doing what. Um, and then also creating some tools which will be of common interest ac across the different governments and even sub-national uh, governments. Um, a key point being utilities are all looking at uh, similar questions around uh, deployment of advanced meters or advanced transmission technologies and so on. And so uh, the International Smart Grid Action Network will look for common uh, tools that can be applied uh, by all of those that are evaluating multi-billion dollar investments uh, and, and trying to encourage um, uh, faster and better uh, analysis of what makes sense uh, given uh, respective conditions. Just say briefly a few words about uh, the, um, the energy access uh, initiative that I mentioned before. And I mention it here in part because in many ways it is ultimately an energy efficiency initiative. Uh, this is uh, an effort that builds on um, a successful program from the International Finance Corporation. Um, it is uh, three to one financed by Italy and the U.S. Uh, government um, with uh, 30 million from Italy and 10 million from the U.S. Uh, over a, um, a, a five-year period. Uh, and we think that it uh, will get to uh, a, uh, millions of households reached with high-efficiency off-grid appliances uh, that, that uh, replace uh, far less efficient and more costly fuel-based lighting. Um, and, and really, when you compare a kerosene wick lantern with a high-efficiency LED uh, lantern, in many cases powered by solar, uh, you are looking at something like a 50 times factor uh, improvement in the cost-effectiveness per uh, lux, uh, lux hour produced. Um, the key challenge in this marketplace uh, is that there are major quality assurance issues. Um, and there are also some uh, challenges to scaling up the supply chains. Uh, and this initiative will take a successful model in the East Africa context and help to bring it to a global scale, including in places like uh, India and Indonesia. Uh, and we're excited about it as an example of uh, an area where a global approach and cooperation among uh, these participating governments uh, can help us to address a key efficiency opportunity. Just uh, wrap up here with a final initiative, which is really a cross-cutting initiative, uh, the Clean Energy Solution Center. And this is a, a new portal which is aimed at policymakers, first and foremost. Uh, it, will be, it will be launched in a couple of weeks um, when we are in uh, Abu Dhabi for the, um, the second Clean Energy Ministerial. Um, and the purpose of this is to create a single portal that draws on all the existing portals. Um, and creates a synthesized set of, uh, of facts for uh, the staffs of ministers participating in this dialogue, um, including uh, well into the bureaucracy, those that are trying to implement rules on appliances or uh, other kinds of efficiency or clean energy. Uh, and, and we want to, uh, in effect, um, create um, more transparency, more clarity, um, and, and a better sense of what are the policies that are put in place and what are the deployment outcomes that are realized uh, by these participating governments over time? Uh, so this is a place to look at how we're doing relative to the 20 million electric vehicles goal uh, by 2020. This is uh, a place where we can also try to track over time how we're doing in terms of implementing those minimum standards on appliances and what kinds of savings we're realizing uh, collectively. And we also expect that there will be some uh, useful tools for policymakers that are struggling with some of the harder challenges of implementing uh, these complex, uh, at times, policies. And I just want to pause on that point and note that one of the things that this uh, dialogue has already in eight brief months um, really underscored for me is the extent to which uh, participating governments face um, a capacity challenge. There are just not that many um, uh, skilled professionals that know how to do uh, successful rulemaking on minimum standards or these other kinds of tools. Uh, and so everything we can do to empower them to, to move more quickly and to borrow from um, uh, tools that, uh, that can be used collectively, uh, for example, common technical analysis uh, of appliance efficiency potential and costs and uh, and common approaches to looking at um, what constitutes uh, super efficiency if you're looking at government procurement of the very best uh, equipment or appliances. These kinds of things, when shared, um, give, uh, give a chance for uh, really uh, scarce personnel uh, in respective governments to, uh, to do more and more quickly. Uh, the dialogue itself, we also hope, 
uh, puts some attention on their efforts uh, and gives them a chance to appropriately staff up and, and move ahead uh, with support from the highest levels in their, um, in their uh, energy ministries. So I'll just close with a note that this is not the last that you'll be hearing from us. Um, in addition to the um, uh, Abu Dhabi meeting in a couple of weeks, uh, there is a third clean energy ministerial already programmed for uh, uh, London in early 2012. The date is still to be determined. Uh, and we have a fourth government, uh, very uh, exciting um, uh, 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 location uh, that, that is going to be announced in Abu Dhabi. I can't announce the location just yet, but we've secured the, the fourth host. Uh, and in fact, there's uh, another government, uh, I think, ready to go for the fifth ministerial. And that, I think, uh, just to close, is essential because it has only been eight months since we began this effort. Uh, when you're trying to work through uh, national policy implementation uh, and international coordination in, an, in a domain as complicated as energy efficiency, it takes time to get to impact. Uh, we do feel that we're off to an excellent start and we're excited about moving ahead on this. Uh, and the continuity that's provided by these annual meetings uh, is essential to driving that forward. So thank you. Thanks, Rick, for that great overview. It certainly sounds like you've got uh, a lot to be focusing on in the, in the next two weeks, and we'll be looking forward to hearing more about how the ministerial goes. Uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, 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 welcome a, a longtime friend and good friend of the CSIS Energy Program, Kateri Callahan, to do an outlook on energy efficiency gains uh, uh, globally. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to start by thanking Sarah and Frank and the whole team here at CSIS for having me over this morning. It's a real delight. I also owe them a debt of gratitude. They actually took on my daughter a couple of years ago as an intern over here and uh, started her off well in her professional career, so thank you for that. I just want to do a couple of things with my brief time with you this morning. First, I'll spend a, just a moment or two introducing you to my organization, the Alliance to Save Energy, and then spend another moment or two to look back at what we've been able to accomplish with energy efficiency and I'm going to use the United States primarily as the platform for talking about what's going on globally because we're here today, but I will keep threading in and weaving in, I hope, throughout the presentation efforts that are ongoing in the world. And I think with what I would agree wholeheartedly with what Rick has said and with what the Clean Energy Ministerial is doing, and that is the sharing of best practices and solutions as a way to move forward. And what you'll see in the presentation that I'm going to give today is that there's a lot of work in the same areas and on the same types of issues, whether that's appliance standards or building energy codes or looking for incentives and investment. Uh, we'll spend a couple of minutes, because they asked me to, talking about what's going on today and what we can expect in 2011, and then take just a brief look at what I hope we will see in the 21st century, which is really deployment of energy efficiency as our first and our largest resource for meeting our energy requirements. So who's the Alliance to Save Energy? We've been around for three decades. Uh, we are a nonprofit group comprised of an alliance of policymakers, business leaders, environmental groups, academia, consumer interest groups, just a wide array of all of the stakeholders who are interested in and impacted by energy use and how it affects our environment and our energy security. Uh, and importantly, our economy. We have over 80 individuals now. We've grown that large over the course of time. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., but we have initiatives and operations all over the world. We have offices actually in the Ukraine, South Africa, Mexico, and India. The Alliance is really very unique in the NGO world because we have active leadership by sitting members of the U.S. Congress, and you can see pictures of those folks here. We are a nonpartisan group. We bring to together Republicans and Democrats. We bring together members from both the House and the Senate to work with us to advance energy efficiency, particularly their interest is in through public policy. They are joined on our board by about 30 other leaders from business, from academia, from environmental groups. Uh, we have been very blessed with this leadership and I think it's been one of the secrets of our success is working, having the business community, having the researchers working directly with members of Congress who by their position can put forward and see energy efficiency legislation enacted into law. Another thing that makes us very unique for an NGO is the active participation of the business community. We now have over 170 businesses and organizations who are helping us with their with our work. They are not controlling our agenda. That's controlled by our board of directors. They 
are, however, lending their voices in the policy circles. They are providing resources into the programmatic work that we're doing around the world to build capacity, to improve water, energy, transportation, related issues. So we've been very good at engaging a, a strong um, leadership group of businesses from around the world in our activities. So I said we take a look backwards for a moment. I love this slide. This is information that our folks have put together that shows that through a combination of technology improvements, through public policy, we have now we are now offsetting the need for 50 quads of energy in the United States. What that means is if we hadn't made the improvements, if we hadn't put the public policies in place, improved the technologies, improved uh, our productivity, we'd need 50 percent more energy to power our economy today than we are currently using. Can you imagine what the prices at the pump would be and what you'd be paying on your utility bills were that to be the case? It's also important. We, we claim energy efficiency is the largest uh, resource, and I think this shows it very clearly. It's providing more to powering our economy right now than any other resources, resource, including King Coal. One of the things that's driving energy efficiency, and we're seeing this around the world, is public policy. And when we look at what that public policy needs to be, different countries, different economies are going to approach it and have different schemes, but typically you will find that all of the activities are centered in these four buckets. Investment in research, development, and deployment. Keeping money flowing into developing new technologies so that we can keep bringing that technology forward and driving it into our economy for efficiency gains providing incentives so that once you have new technology developed, you can help it gain a foothold in the marketplace against those technologies that are entrenched and in widespread use. Once you gain that foothold, then you have to go out and educate consumers, doing outreach and educating them about the benefits of that new energy efficient technology. We're right on the cusp of this with the new lighting changes that we're going to have in the United States and also in other places around the world. We're going to need to educate people about what those new lamps can do for them, how to, to pick the best light technology for the application. There's going to be a very, very significant education and outreach component there. Finally, once the products have made it and integrated into the marketplace in a real way, that's when you step in and you put the standards and the codes in place that require manufacturers, that require building owners and uh, buildings, building uh, builders, that sounds a little awkward, uh, building builders, to meet minimum efficiency standards and to take those products off the market that are no longer efficient and can deliver what the other products that have been brought forward can. And that cycle can replay and has replayed over and over and over again. And where you see it in the United States starting in 1975 when we put the first appliance standards in place and through a series of other legislation, we have again at the federal level been driving energy efficiency. You can see we've been driving it in all sectors of the economy. There was a lot of activity, as one might expect, in the 70s when we went, underwent our first energy crisis. That activity cooled as energy prices uh, fell in the United States, and we went into a period of, of relative um, unconcern, if you will, and disinterest in energy at a time when we really should have been ramping up. The policy at the federal level picked back up in 2005 and 2007. Again, it tracks when we saw very, very significant rises in energy prices, particularly in oil and gasoline. In 2009, um, with the fall in the economy, we put an economic stimulus package into place, and I'll mention that in a minute, that had all of the various policy tools, the drivers embedded in it. Policies matter. As I said, this is a chart putting together some information from EIA, historic data. The pink line is what EIA projected would happen in terms of growth in energy demand in the United States over the course of time. And what you can see is the actual energy use in the blue line has been significantly reduced from that. Now, that's not all public policy, but public policy has played a role. And what I want to show you there in particular on that is that the annual energy outlook in 2005 before enactment of EPACT 05 and the 2007 Act uh, was significantly higher than what has proven to be the actual case. And a lot of that reduction in the demand has come through the public policy. 
the bad news, good news story is that energy demand worldwide continues to grow. Uh, you can see that top dotted line, though, it actually has come down a bit from the projections that were made just three years ago. Some of that, a lot of that has to do with the economy, but some of that has to do with worldwide public policies that are being put in place to cut demand. In the United States, what we've done as well is to up production. Um, with, with a lot of the, the increase in production is coming from biofuels, but also from the increase in gasoline prices, um, which drives domestic production. But consumption's come down a bit. And again, this is a result in part from the economic downturn, but also importantly in part because of the recent public policies that we have put in place. We still have a long way to go to close that gap. I'm going to skip over those. The other, only other thing I want to mention about our energy use, because this plays very significantly in terms of driving public policy and gaining attention of policymakers, and that is the impact of our petroleum use on our trade deficit. Right now, petroleum, as you can see in this chart, represents about $265 billion of our overall trade deficit. That's $850 per man, woman, and child in the U.S. It's very significant, and it was even higher. It was about about $1,200 per man, woman, and child when uh, the price of oil uh, went to its peak in August of 2008. There are significant opportunities. This is why folks are focused on energy efficiency to take down that growing demand to address national energy security concerns that I just mentioned and to improve our environment. This is work done by the McKinsey Global Institute that shows, uh, the top bar shows demand growing between now and 2020. And each of the blue chunks underneath it shows where there are cost effective opportunities for energy efficiency. These are investments in energy efficiency that have an internal rate of return of 10% or greater. McKenzie has looked at this and said that if we as a world invest $170 billion a year in energy efficiency, we can realize a net savings of $900 billion a year. So these are investments that pay very significantly back into the economy, and you can see that every sector of the economy has significant room for energy efficiency gains. We in the United States, as well as uh, countries around the world, when we put in place our economic stimulus bills, we looked at investment in clean energy solutions. And in the U U.S., uh, we put $65 billion, made that available out of a total budget of about $90 billion for clean energy investments, so about 72, 73 percent went to energy efficiency. And this shows you through a wide array of different programs, from weatherization to smart grid uh, to investment in government buildings. This is a, a, an example of what we've done in the U.S., but globally, if you take a look at the investment in energy efficiency and in clean energy, this broader writ, about half of the investments being made by the world's governments in the clean energy and climate sector are going to energy efficiency. So this is something, I'm, again, I'm using the U.S. as an example, but this is happening worldwide, and those monies are going into our economy even as we speak. So it's time, I say, to seize the day and look at 2011 and where we may go from here. One of the things that, that is, is going on currently, and there were just hearings in the Senate last week, is that we are trying in the United States to put forward and enact consensus appliance standards. These are standards that the manufacturers of the products, and there are a number of products, I have some of them, there are dozens of products in this um, bill, but I've listed some of them out for you here. These manufacturers have agreed to these energy efficiency standards. The advocates, the environmentalists involved in it have agreed, policymakers from both sides of the aisle, represented here by the two leaders of the Senate Energy Committee, Senators Bingaman and Murkowski, have agreed that this is a step forward. This follows what com countries around the world have been doing in putting forward consensus or putting forward appliance standards, setting efficiency levels for products and equipment. It follows a rich tradition, and Rick mentioned the refrigerator, but we've been setting standards on all types of appliances since the 1970s. Uh, you can see here that the savings are significant, whether you talk about energy saved, it's the equivalent of 4.6 million homes a year by 2030, or in dollars, $43 billion in net economic savings to the country by putting these in place. That's a path we can take. Another path we could take is rolling back consensus standards, which is also something that the U.S. Congress is trying to do today, both on the House and the Senate side. I mentioned light bulbs earlier. We put in place as part of the 2007 Act 
a um, an, an technology neutral efficiency standard that affects all of the general purpose lamps in the United States. Those standards go into effect in 2011. Um, stores like IKEA have already taken all of the products off their shelves that don't meet, meet these standards. The manufacturers are producing lights that meet the standards and these are still incandescent bulbs regardless of what you may have heard about this. Halogen incandescent lighting meets, can meet this standard. Uh, these are technology neutral so you will still have incandescent technology, you will still have CFLs in the marketplace and you'll have light emitting diodes so lots of choice in the marketplace. If we were to roll back these standards which again the manufacturers have agreed to and are working toward, the cost to our economy would be about $15.8 billion, $200 a family, uh, because of the loss in the energy savings that we would otherwise realize through these standards. In the investment, the President has proposed a huge step forward, even at such a, a time of, of federal deficits, because I, there's a belief within the administration, and I think Rick pointed to this clearly, that we can't afford not to invest in clean energy and energy efficiency. So the President, even while he's pared back very significantly other parts of the budget, he's proposing a doubling in the investment in energy efficiency. I've put down some of the new initiatives, the Better Buildings Initiative in particular, uh, as part of his proposed budget for fiscal year. 2012. However, others of the federal policymakers are looking at cutting very significantly investments in energy efficiency. You have HR1, the continuing resolution that was put forward by the House, proposed to cut about 35 percent of the EERE, Energy Efficiency Renewable Energy Budget, that it, for 2011, for this current fiscal year. They would stop all funding to the weatherization program, which has provided weatherization to 6.4 million Americans, which is saving those families about $450 a year on their energy bills. They were not successful in getting HR1 through, but the two continuing resolutions that we've seen while they work through the differences between the House and Senate, between the Republicans and the Democrats, are continuing to slash. And they're slashing at a rate that gets them to the levels that I'm showing you here in HR1. So we're calling this death by a thousand cuts or more, more precisely de death by however many weeks are left in the fiscal year budget, 43 or 44. Um, again, looking at, at what's going on here, and you're seeing this in the United, in, in other countries as well, and it was mentioned by Rick, uh, governments are leading by cleaning up and getting their own houses in order. Here we have the executive order on federal leadership. It's called the Green Gov. Uh, order lovingly by those that are, are working under it. Um, but the federal government has for many years, for about 20 years now, been working on improving energy use within its own systems. The federal government's the largest energy user, single energy user in the United States. So what they do matters. And they are bringing to bear the federal purse uh, and the power of that federal purse to begin to transition and change not only their own energy use, but um, those of others uh, in the United States and around the world. So let me get off the U.S. for a minute and look at what's going on in Europe. Um, there are several different European efforts underway. The Europeans have put in place a uh, goal now, it's not a mandatory target, but a goal of reducing their energy use 20% by 2020. Um, by their own admission, if they continue with the programs that I'm about to show you and at the pace they're going, they are likely to make only half of that, to make only 10% by 2020. So they are hard at work in putting in place, in, in watching what's going on and looking at additional programs that they may need to put in place. So I'm going to talk first just real quickly about the eco design effort. This again looks at appliance standards just as we're doing in the United States. Um, there is an initiative underway now on standby power for nine different products that when it is put in place is projected to save about 12 percent of the electricity consumed in the European Union. So very significant what they are doing on appliance standards. They're working on buildings. In the United States we just uh, got, in, got uh, the International Codes uh, committee to put in place a new 2012 code that will improve the energy efficiency of buildings by 30 percent. In the European Union, they are working on something called the efficiency um, 
uh, efficiency program for building directives. And there you can see they're looking at a methodology for calculating integrated building energy performance, just like we are in the United States, minimum standards for new construction, and then energy certification for both the new and existing buildings and regular inspections. Uh, so again, very much a framework like you see in the United States. Um, again, they just put out a new report that showed that they are off the target of making their goal of 20% uh, reduction. So they are going to look again in 2013 at the outcome of the various programs that they have in place and new ones that they are putting in place currently. And if they do not meet their goals or don't project that they're going to meet their goals in 2013, they will look at making that target mandatory and binding on the member states. One of the things that we've been doing in Europe to try to make similar, I've got the same uh, same problem you have with your, <laughs> with your animation. Uh, we have created a sister organization called the Alliance to Save Energy. It's populated and led by uh, leaders from the government and from business in Europe. And they are going to be working very, very hard to make sure that the EU meets its policy directive goals and that the policy makers continue to work with the member states on implementation, which is a very, very significant issue. When you look ahead at what we're going to do in the United States, and I hope will happen uh, in this Congress, if not in this year, certainly, uh, we have work, as I mentioned, on appliance standards that's already teed up and ready to go. Uh, we have building energy code legislation that was part of both the climate bill that passed the House and the energy bill that came out of the Senate Energy Committee in the last Congress ready to go. We have legislation that will correct um, the problems that we have in the mortgage underwriting and appraisal process um, that is impeding energy efficiency in the residential and the commercial building markets, tax incentives, rebate programs for uh, residential, for deep residential retrofits, energy efficiency retrofits, and building retrofits, and then potentially an energy efficiency resource standard or a clean energy standard that would allow energy efficiency to demonstrate 100 percent compliance. We also will be working on appropriations, keeping those at or above the investment levels proposed by the President, and looking at the regulatory arena uh, with the work that's being done by the Environmental Protection Agency to make sure that energy efficiency is advantage as those rules are put forward and put into place. So we've got a lot to do and we've got a long way to go if we're going to be energy efficient in the world and in the United States. And I put up two bars here. Uh, I like to use Japan as a reference case because they are an industrialized nation, one of the powerhouses in the world. And if you look at their total primary energy consumption per capita, they are very, very significantly below where we are here in the United States. So I put this up as a challenge to us all that we can do better. And how can we do better? We can learn from one another. Sarah set me up for this, as did Rick, and so I don't feel so bad about the blatant, <laughs> blatant advertising I'm doing here. But we are going to have a meeting in Brussels, Belgium, in 2011 that will bring together the leaders from around the world to look at what the best practices are, to look at what the common challenges, the common barriers to driving energy efficiency into the market are, and to come up with solutions that can be custom tailored to these various economies and to these various circumstances, whether it's in the industrial arena, whether it's transportation, or whether it's in the built environment. Um, I hope all of you will plan to join us. We already have people registered from 42 countries, I'm told, and we have some of the leading uh, heads of state, as you can see, the EU president, um, Buzak, will be on hand to speak along with a cast of others. So with that, I thank you for your time and I look forward to the session this afternoon. Great, that's wonderful. See, like I said early April is all about energy efficiency. So should you want to go to the UAE and then Brussels, you could just make a trip out of it. Um, we, we're a little bit behind time, but it would be an awful, awful shame uh, to, to have Rick and Kateri here without taking a few questions. For those of you who are regulars, you know our ground rules, but I'll certainly repeat them. Uh, please uh, wait for a microphone. Uh, please uh, state your name and affiliation, and if you can make your question concise and actually in the form of a question, uh, that would uh, be much appreciated. What I'm going to do is I'll take a few questions just so we can get a couple on the table, and then Rick and uh, Kateri can answer them. Okay? Uh, the two in the back there, and then one on the way back. 
Well, good morning. Frank Stewart with the American Association of Blacks and Energy. First of all, let me again thank you for your presentation and also acknowledge the enormous work that the Alliance has done over these many years. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention today and ask your opinion on was some recent analysis uh, that suggests that if you look at the entire system in terms of appliance performance uh, to include the utilization of particularly new technologies, that the sum, the net sum, does not reflect the projection, that the actual utilization of newer technologies that are more efficient creates greater usage, not unlike the VMT issues we used to face in the past. Have you looked at those pieces and are you including within your analysis an understanding of the impact of the user and his adaptation of, to the new technologies? Okay, great. We'll take the question right next to you. Yep. Yes, uh, I'm Philip Hughes with the White House Writers Group and uh, wanted to pose a question particularly to, uh, to Rick Duke. Uh, your hopeful remarks about uh, the development of um, uh, electric vehicles and the uh, targets for electric vehicle deployment that you mentioned. I'm just wondering how the achievement of those targets and the ambitions we have for electric vehicles are squaring up with generating capacity to power them, especially in light of now the nuclear accident ongoing in Japan, which is going to surely make a dent in the what seemed to be an emerging renaissance of interest in nuclear power, uh, the reputation of coal, uh, the difficulties of expanding much our hydropower uh, capacity. Uh, Where is this electricity going to come from? Okay. And then Rachel. Hi, thank you both. I'm Rachel Posner. I'm with the energy program at CSIS, sort of, on detail right now in the Department of Defense. Um, my question is very similar to the question that was just asked. Um, looking at targets and the countries that you talked about that are setting these energy efficiency targets, I'm sure it's different in each one, but is there a general process that's followed or a specific group of people that are responsible for deciding what an energy efficiency target is? What year is it going to be and how is it realistic? Is it 20 percent? Is it 25 percent? Why isn't it 30%? How, do, how does that process come about, and you know, how maybe is it different in different countries? That's interesting. Okay, we'll take those three questions, and either one of you can uh, uh, start to address any uh, component piece. I'm sorry. The, dif the difficulty, uh, as, as you might imagine, um, is that there's a wide variety of both ability to get things done and um, the rate of speed at which things can be done in various um, countries. So it is a country by country, and as I mentioned in my, my remarks, one of the concerns that people that are operating in that environment and who want to drive energy efficiency is that you can have these great directives set at the EU level, but it's all about implementation. And I would give you the example here in the United States on building codes. They're set by a national code setting body. Uh, they're confirmed by the, affirmed by the Department of Energy certified, and then the states have to adopt them, then the municipalities have to enforce them. So we have a real patchwork in the United States going from that 30 percent, what I'll call the holy grail of the national code that was just adopted down to what's actually happening on the ground level. And I think that that flows very much the same in Europe. Um, the second, on the impact of the user analysis, there is work that's being done on that, and I will see what I can find. I don't know whether there's anything um, that, that has come out of it. I mean, certainly this is something that people have looked at uh, very significantly and very closely. I guess my comment to that would be, though, you know, where we're growing the plug loads in the homes are in consumer electronics. Uh, that's where you're seeing the most significant growth. And in vampire, uh, use of vampire power. So those, those pieces of equipment like your TV that use power even in the off mode. So that's where I think we need to spend a lot of our time and because that's where we're seeing the growth. I'll leave electric vehicles to Rick. 
So I'll start with electric vehicles. Uh, I think that the, um, the question is an interesting one. When you look at the electric vehicle targets that are in place, though, uh, it's a question in some ways for a decade from now or two decades from now, uh, because where we are today is uh, such a nascent market for electric vehicles. Uh, it's an exciting market. There's a huge amount happening. There's real momentum. Um, but we need to work quite hard to get to something like this 20 million by 2020 goal. And if we get there, then by 2030, you could start to see a very meaningful impact on power consumption from electric vehicles. Uh, and we hope to be in that place in order to have the associated uh, national uh, security benefits and economic benefits um, and clean, uh, um, clean energy benefits that would come from that kind of full-scale uh, national and, and ultimately global deployment of electric vehicles. But it is starting from a very small base. So the implications for electricity consumption for the next decade are really quite modest. Uh, and, and in many ways, the challenge is to, is to make sure that uh, they become uh, more significant uh, than, than the current prospects. It, it's just going to take quite a bit of time to start from essentially scratch on electric vehicles and get them to the point where they are uh, substantially affecting uh, our, our power requirements. Can I add um, something? Yeah. And just add something very quickly to it. it. It also, I think, has a lot to do with when you are going to charge those vehicles. And if we can get the charging off peak, um, then we have, I think, much, much more ability to take larger and larger numbers. So there's going to be a lot of work that's going to be needed to be done to make sure that people are charging the vehicles at time when energy, when the demand on the electric grid um, is lower, not when it's at its peak. That, that's absolutely correct. And of course, in certain uh, geographic areas, uh, individual states and so on, you may see meaningful impact on load uh, sooner and, and having these kinds of uh, time of use charging uh, strategies and, and other approaches um, uh, to, to optimize the way that electric vehicles are integrated into the, the charging uh, system um, it will be helpful. Uh, I think that's an example of the kind of thing that can be learned um, from sharing experiences in the, uh, in the cities that are uh, participating in the electric vehicle initiative uh, through the ministry. Um, and I think it's also the kind of um, uh, challenge that uh, we'll see a whole range of governments uh, facing once electric vehicles begin to get to scale. Interestingly, um, Government of India, that has been a very active participant in the Clean Energy Ministerial, uh, recently announced uh, their efforts to uh, scale up electric vehicles, which is striking given that they, of course, face uh, significant uh, power capacity uh, shortages. Uh, and I think that's uh, part of the, the long-term vision for the Government of India to move towards a, a clean and secure uh, energy economy. Uh, and I think perhaps part of that, I, I, I don't know the exact details of the motivation, but I think part of their rationale may be that this really is a long-term question. It will be some time before electric vehicle uptake in India begins to have a meaningful impact on, on their power demand requirements. But if they begin the process now of rolling things out rationally, uh, it can become a part of their overall energy system uh, in a way that will ultimately be helpful to them. Uh, I think I'll just make a brief uh, plug, uh, pun intended, uh, for the uh, clean energy standard as well. Uh, when it comes to the question of um, making sure that electric vehicles are, are definitively clean, uh, of course, making sure that they're charged with uh, clean electricity is, is an important part of that. Um, and I think that um, uh, you, you referenced the, um, the crisis in, in Japan uh, and uh, some of the other challenges to uh, clean supply uh, scale up. And I just want to underscore that uh, the vision laid out by the, the President and the State of the Union around the clean energy standard uh, is a fundamentally technology neutral approach among clean energy options and as such is a very resilient uh, strategy to drive uh, progress on clean energy. Uh, and one benefit of that is that as electric vehicles uh, get to scale in the context of a clean energy standard, you would uh, ensure that they are charged with uh, increasingly clean electricity over time. Uh, very briefly on the question of uh, targets, so the third question raised, um, I would just uh, suggest that at least in the context of the uh, work we're doing through the Clean Energy Ministerial, uh, efficiency targets are ultimately up to the uh, respective governments participating in these dialogues. Uh, but there is some real value in discussion of uh, the underlying technical analysis that motivates those targets. Um, and in the case of appliances, for example, that applies both to what's the appropriate minimum standard for my government, well, 
well, it's helpful if I can draw on an analysis of televisions or whatever it is that has been created uh, through this super efficient equipment and appliances deployment program, uh, which, by the way, I should mention has uh, over 15 million in funding over a five-year period for just this kind of uh, technical work um, that we uh, expect will be useful to the European Commission and to ourselves and India and other governments actively participating. Similarly, on the high end, uh, there are opportunities to look at uh, common development of performance-based standards for procuring the very best equipment, uh, and there's a, a really compelling uh, uh, group of companies that includes Walmart and Target and many others that the Department of Energy has worked with on setting uh, performance-based procurement standards for high-efficiency air conditioners. Uh, through this dialogue, we're looking at internationalizing that kind of an approach on the high end as well. But at the end of the day, these are uh, questions that individual governments need to set for themselves. That's excellent. You know, in the interest of saving some time for uh, our, our, our panel discussion of just following this, I think we're going to uh, end the first part of our program. You know, in addition to thanking Rick and, and Kateri for their excellent presentations, I also want to congratulate them on uh, what is a, an, an enormous and impressive amount of work that they're doing uh, on the energy efficiency and clean energy front at a time where we've got so much going on around the world, you know, with the sort of heart-wrenching disaster that's going on in, in uh, Japan, but also the furious activity. Uh, historic activity that's going on uh, in the Middle East and the impact on uh, on oil prices. It's good to know that uh, folks are working equally as hard on the clean energy and energy efficiency front, so you should be congratulated for that. So uh, please help me thank uh, uh, Kateri and Rick. Thank you. I don't know. It just went quiet. Uh, I'd like to invite Doug Arendt, who is uh, the director of the Joint Institute for Strategic Energy and Analysis. Uh, and our next panel up uh, for uh, uh, our discussion of uh, some of these uh, energy efficient uh, activities. Somehow it was unplugged and the battery died, but we're good uh. now. Yes, this is what we're looking for? Uh, we need Um, when you all have a, a chance to um, refresh your, uh, your, your uh, refreshments in the back, uh, we'll go ahead and, uh, and try to get started here in, a, in another uh, short few seconds, uh, if we can. We uh, want to be uh, respectful of uh, your time and also the time of our experts here. Um, so my pleasure to, uh, to co-host this uh, event uh, along with my colleagues at uh, CSIS. Uh, always a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to engage in, I think, a, a very uh, mindful dialogue about uh, energy issues uh, in relation to uh, global issues as well as uh, national security and, and geopolitics. And in particular, uh, I'm uh, pleased to moderate uh, the following panel, uh, which really furthers the dialogue around energy efficiency in a number of different aspects. And uh, I think that you'll find uh, the flow of, uh, of the, the content uh, uh, very nicely uh, following on from uh, from the overviews of uh, Rick and Katiri. Uh, what we're going to do is uh, ask uh, Graham Pugh uh, to begin with uh, detailing out a bit uh, more about the energy efficiency uh, actions underneath the Clean Energy Ministerial, and then we'll follow on and look at uh, some uh, corporate perspectives uh, as well as uh, some uh, global uh, perspectives on the energy efficiency potential. And then Russell uh, is going to be uh, the cleanup batter at the end. Um, to uh, really focus on the financier's perspective. And, and I think uh, what this brings to bear really is, is the combination of understanding of how policy interacts with technology and industry and finance and that we really need all pieces of the puzzle uh, to, be, uh, to be effective in order to bring solutions to bear. So with that kind of overview and introduction, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Graham Pugh who's going to talk uh, more about the energy efficiency actions underneath the Clean Energy Ministerial. 
Thanks, Doug, and uh, thanks very much to uh, CSIS for uh, arranging this event. And uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, to be here and uh, among friends and on on such a good panel. Um, I want to uh, extend um, some of the remarks that uh, that Rick made about the Clean Energy Ministerial um, to uh, focus on uh, just uh, two two initiatives and give a little bit more detail uh, on those. Uh, mainly the uh, Super Efficient Equipment and Appliance uh, Deployment Initiative and the uh, Global Superior Energy Performance Initiative. So uh, now for the, the, the wonky part of our program. Um, you know, I think the, the, the key notion here, um, in, uh, in particularly in the Appliance Initiative, is uh, one of global market transformation. Uh, it's clear that uh, it's it, it's uh, incredibly important to uh, shape markets to accomplish the objectives that, that you want to achieve. But there are a number of tools at our disposal that we've learned about over the years that we can, that we can apply. So uh, we tend to think uh, when we're talking about uh, equipment and, uh, and appliances that uh, standards are, uh, are the only solution. Um, but we know, in fact, that there are a number of different tools that can help us achieve this objective. So keeping in mind the three fundamental principles of, uh, of, of this initiative, which is, uh, you know, number one, raise the ceiling by pulling more efficient uh, equipment and appliances into the marketplace. Number two, um, uh, raise the floor, right, which is, which is the minimum standards approach. And then number three, do the uh, supporting technical analysis that's necessary to identify the greatest opportunities in, in, in markets around the world. And so that's what we're trying to do in this initiative. And uh, there are actually five different working groups focused on different, uh, different approaches for this. So one of them is, uh, is the standards work that, um, that Rick spoke to, and, and I'll tell you a little bit more about. But another exciting program that we're set to launch uh, in the upcoming ministerial is an awards program for the most efficient uh, uh, product uh, category that I'll tell you more about. Uh, further, there's uh, the role of incentives, which is uh, how um, uh, more efficient equipment and appliances can be pulled into the marketplace. And there are roles for energy providers as well as governments in, in this. Uh, utilities uh, are often have the most direct uh, connection to, uh, to uh, e electricity consumers, and so they provide a, a very direct means for uh, delivering uh, incentives to change consumer behavior. Um, and, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, procurement and the role that uh, uh, procurement can play, both government procurement in terms of sometimes uh, seeding the market, making uh, the initial investments that are required to uh, really sca uh, scale up um, uh, particular categories of, uh, of efficient equipment and appliances, and uh, also the, 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 the role that uh, key private sector players can uh, uh, can play in in uh, in procurement, and finally, just a just a, a note about uh, the cross cutting aspect of uh, of doing the analysis necessary to identify uh, the high value opportunities. So, um, you know, just a bit on on the standards front. If you if you take the uh, the graph that that Rick showed about, uh, which is one of the se Secretary Chu's favorites. Uh, about uh, the historical rate of improvement of efficiency in refrigerators. And you extend that, as Kateri indicated, across uh, a number of appliance categories um, where, where minimum standards have been applied. Or alternatively, you look at the impact of labeling programs, for example, in the EU that have, that, you know, have really accomplished very similar gains through a different policy mechanism. What you realize is that there are definite ways that we can improve the rate of improvement of efficiency in these product categories over time. But that what we've accomplished to date is, has largely been a series of independent national actions. Now, we recognize that those actions will always be taken at the national level. Nobody is, uh, at this time anyway, uh, advocating for an international uh, uh, you know, standard that would apply to all governments. But at the same time, if we're doing technical analysis to understand what the potential is in a product category in the United States, why not share that with the EU when we're sourcing from many of the same manufacturers? So harmonization of the test procedures, sharing of the analytical basis, for making progress on these uh, on, on these uh, standards or, 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 or labeling uh, type 
uh, type of activities is is very important and so that's what we intend to do and um, so it's it's uh, it, it's it, you know if you imagine that you have these types of activities you can if if you're going about the process of implementing these more efficiently you can apply them more broadly to other product categories you can perhaps synchronize the timing of the implementation of these so the global market gets a clear signal about what the next ratcheting you know up uh, level is or the next opportunity for uh, for for their manufacturing uh, is is going to be so that's uh, that's the key notion uh, around what we want to do with harmonization of uh, of the standards. You know, I mentioned the um, the the awards. So uh, we've been hard at work um, uh, in, on the high end in terms of uh, creating. Uh, a global award uh, and also some associated regional awards for uh, the most uh, efficient example of uh, a, a particular product category and uh, we'll be announcing that um, uh, at the Clean Energy Ministerial. Um, it will take some time before the uh, the award is actually given but that's uh, actually if you think uh, if, if you backtrack from what you want to do, which is send a signal to the manufacturers that they have to, you know, they have an opportunity to sell into the marketplace uh, a product uh, that could potentially be the recipient of an award that they can then put on their uh, boxes for their selling season and say this is, uh, you know, uh, what, what, whatever the label is going to be, the most efficient uh, uh, you know, um, product recognized globally, then you give the manufacturers advance notice, they get this into their, uh, their sales cycle, and, uh, uh, and, and so we're going to be announcing that the award uh, is, is being launched. We'll be sharing the criteria with the manufacturers, and uh, it's, it's going to be exciting to see this move forward. We've, uh, we've, we've picked one, uh, one category of, uh, of appliances that are uh, globally, uh, globally traded, and we uh, expect to, to move on to others uh, in, in the future. Um, let me talk a little bit about, um, about incentives. And, and I mentioned that, um, you know, in this country, we have uh, a lot of experience with utility demand side management programs. Uh, I think uh, many of you are probably familiar with incentives either offered through the utility, your utility or through the state uh, or recently even federal incentives for purchasing of um, energy efficient uh, equipment appliances or you know, home improvements, these types of things. We're working to share practices across these types of demand side management programs around the world and implement them more broadly. So I think we know that there are smart ways and not so smart ways to roll out these types of things. You have to set the incentive at the right level to motivate consumer behavior, but obviously if you set it too generous, you bankrupt the program very quickly without getting much uh, improvement in the marketplace. And so there's, there's, uh, there's an art, I think, and some you know, uh, smart analysis around this that, uh, that, that we're seeking to, to share globally. Um, and then uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, is just talk a little bit about the procurement example, highlighting uh, something Rick actually mentioned in, in the Q&A. But um, this is some recent work that was done through the Department of Energy with the Commercial Buildings uh, Energy Alliance. And here, here's an example of uh, procurement done by private sector players who have a real interest in ensuring that uh, they have a choice of uh, efficient products uh, because uh, in, uh, in, in their case, uh, in this particular case, rooftop air conditioning for uh, big box retailers, it's a substantial portion of their costs. And um, so what happened is uh, because the Department of Energy in the, in the um, Appliance Standards Program has great familiarity with uh, what is technically possible for um, uh, air conditioning. Uh, they were able to sort of um, uh, work with some major retailers and also with uh, air conditioning manufacturers to, in fact, identify an opportunity for those uh, manufacturers to produce um, uh, rooftop air conditioners at a higher performance level than are currently available in the marketplace and to have a commitment from uh, these retailers um, assuming uh, you know the price point is is uh, right to make uh, you know major volume uh, purchases of these so um, you know when I first heard about this um, you know I thought well what role does the Department of Energy have in managing the supply chain for you know a major retailer but in fact there are times when 
you know, for a retailer, their core business is not focusing necessarily on what their air conditioner is on their rooftop. Their core business is getting products to consumers. But it turns out we can we can uh, use some of the knowledge that that we have to to create these opportunities. And uh, and we want to extend this type of example in the global context and see if there might be other opportunities in in different product categories. So. Um, Finally, all of this information and the, and the cross-cutting uh, analysis um, that supports it is going to be available on, uh, on an, another website called uh, superefficient.org. And superefficient.org will be um, available um, at the launch of the Clean Energy Ministerial. If you are an equipment and appliance efficiency wonk, this will be the site for you. Um, we will certainly link to this site from cm.org and, uh, and the solution center that, uh, that, that Rick alluded to. Um, but uh, this is uh, going to be the more in-depth technical resource for uh, people around the world who, who really want to, uh, to draw on, uh, on, on the, the rich uh, uh, amount of information that's available to, to really use best practices in formulating policies. So let me just touch briefly on, uh, on the other initiative, which is the Global Superior Energy Performance Initiative. And just, just a couple words on that. I think Rick highlighted um, the, uh, the, the certification part of this, which builds on the Superior Energy Performance uh, Program that uh, DOE has been engaged in, focused uh, initially on uh, industrial facilities, but now expanding to commercial buildings. And we want to uh, broaden that now to uh, the international context. And, and the notion is as follows. It's, it's easy for um, uh, private sector partners to set a, uh, an energy efficient improvement goal. But unless that can be verified in terms of actual performance, it's not a bankable transaction. And a bankable transaction, something that's third party verified, is something that is of interest to energy providers. So you can imagine that if a utility has an industrial customer who says, I'm going to reduce by 2% next year, if the utility can count on that, that it being achieved, then that uh, has a tremendous value. Uh, to the utility because they can better project their uh, their capacity needs. And so, um, you know, th th those linkages have not all been established, but the notion is that um, setting goals, uh, measuring those goals accurately, uh, having the third party verification is, is, uh, is, is a key way of, uh, of ensuring that we get the real gains that, uh, that we can get uh, in those, those facilities. Um, I think uh, just just a mention of, of two more things on uh, GSEP, and then I'll, then I'll stop. Um, w one is that um, we have another working group that we're excited about that has just uh, started under GSEP, which is a combined heat and power group, and uh, also in incorporates efficient uh, district heating and, and cooling. Uh, Finland is leading this initiative, but uh, some of you who are familiar with uh, What's been going on in DOE? You know that uh, has been work uh, for for many years in this area. Uh, EPA has also uh, been involved, uh, so we're looking forward to um, to uh, rolling out that group, and we have um, some interesting linkages also to. Um, uh, for, for those of you who sort of follow uh, uh, climate issues more closely to black carbon reduction in the Arctic, uh, there are some very inefficient uh, facilities, particularly in uh, Russia, that if you could improve uh, the, the uh, efficiency with uh, combined heat and power applications, uh, you could get black carbon reductions and the, the associated climate benefits. So uh, that's, that's an important focus area. And then the last piece is just to emphasize that, um, uh, again, for those of you who have followed um, international uh, technical cooperation in, in, uh, in, uh, in the energy sector, um, the, the Asia-Pacific Partnership is now uh, phasing out. That uh, was a partnership that started with six and then uh, seven uh, governments and uh, I think had a track record of uh, success using a public-private partnership model in key areas such as uh, uh, the power sector, steel, uh, aluminum, cement. Um, those uh, uh, projects are uh, going to be transitioning um, uh, 
to uh, this, uh, the, the GSEP model under the Clean Energy Ministerial. The notion is that this provides us the opportunity, one, to sort of take stock of which parts of those activities have been successful and are worth continuing and, and maybe which aren't, and then also expanding beyond the original six or seven partner uh, countries and uh, uh, seeing, seeing what we can do more broadly. But the key there is a public-private uh, partnership model, uh, the involvement of uh, trade associations, and uh, trying to improve the general level of uh, performance in, in, in targeted sectors. Um, so I think I'll stop there, but that's just uh, an, an example of uh, when you drill down into these uh, initiatives that we're um, that, that we talk about in the ministerial, there's actually uh, a rich level of detail, a uh, huge amount of uh, effort and uh, resources uh, within the department and within uh, the labs and the contractors that we're using that are focused on, on real technical cooperation. And, and that's something that um, is, is very satisfying um, you know, because the Clean Energy Ministerial, as you can see, involves this peer-to-peer uh, -peer dialogue at a very high level with ministers, and it also involves working level, uh, you know, innumerable uh, uh, international phone calls at odd hours of the day and night, dealing with your counterparts in other countries to really make progress on substantive issues. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Graham, for that uh, more uh, rich, detailed uh, description of uh, the activities under the CEM. I think in, in, uh, in light of the time, what I'm going to do is uh, invite Jennifer Lakey, uh, who is the director uh, of uh, the Johnson uh, Controls Institute for Building Efficiency, uh, to come up and give us a presentation. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, that will be a, a very nice transition from uh, some of the, uh, the policy activities at the CEM to uh, really what the perspectives are on energy efficiency opportunity. If you just hit the button. Just hit the bu button. Yeah. Good morning, and thank you for having me uh, join you today. This has been an interesting conversation, and I'm looking forward to, I'm going to walk quickly through my presentation because I'm looking forward to a discussion at the conclusion. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the vision for global market transformation, and I'm going to share with you today a little bit more uh, about some of what we're seeing in that market, some of the barriers and the opportunities and challenges uh, that I've been tracking through the Institute for Building Efficiency. Let me move on to give you uh, the slide that overviews what Johnson Controls is. For those of you who don't know about Johnson Controls, it's a global diversified country, company. We work in 150 countries around the world, uh, and we have three major businesses, energy efficiency in buildings, uh, power solutions, which is uh, automobile and uh, vehicle batteries, lithium ion, as well as traditional batteries, uh, and the automotive experience business, which focuses on automobile interiors and dashboards. I want to uh, also note that this month we were pleased and honored to be named the number one corporate citizen in social responsibility by CRO Magazine. The Institute for Building Efficiency is a global initiative of the building efficiency business at Johnson Controls. We launched in April, a year, just about a year ago, in the United States and are working actively in China, India, and in Europe as well as here. Uh, it's a global initiative to provide information and analysis on the technologies, policies, and practices uh, to improve the performance of buildings and to implement smart energy systems around the world. We do this from a practitioner's perspective. So my goal is to engage with stakeholders outside of Johnson Controls as well as those inside Johnson Controls to talk about what we're seeing in the markets. Uh, and one of our signature initiatives was the Energy Efficiency Indicator Study, which I'm going to share a few of the results uh, with you uh, about with you today. The study is a look at decision makers' priorities, practices, and approaches. So what we do is interview individuals who have or, uh, two, met two criteria. The first criteria is that they must have capital uh, in either the uh, operations budget or financial authority to make decisions around the energy measures in their buildings and operations. The second is that they must also uh, be monitoring their energy use and and they're the decision makers for any improvements in their facilities. This is a global survey. We focused on 10 countries last year, and we are in the process of conducting the survey again, which will close on April 8th, and we'll be announcing global results in June. 
Energy management is an incredibly important topic to those individuals and those decision makers who we uh, surveyed last year. If you'll note the slide that I put up to right now, uh, you'll see that there is in all regions over 50% of the respondents indicate that energy management is either important, is very important, or extremely important in, in their uh, priorities. What you'll also note is that India and China <laughs> actually reported over 80% in either very important or extremely important. So energy management is uniquely global in its priority and in fact even more important to decision makers outside of the developed countries in the US and Europe. We saw that the drivers for energy management and energy efficiency uh, in fact were unique and very common. So the very common, everybody wants to save money. The number one driver globally for energy management, energy efficiency is cost savings. However, you'll note a couple of differences that I think are worth uh, um, uh, taking note of. The uh, second most important global reason for reducing, uh, for taking on energy efficiency was greenhouse gas reductions. However, in the US, that was actually a much lower priority. And in the United States, you saw a, a, an interesting um, perspective around the government and utility incentives and rebates be, a, as a driver for taking actions. So in fact, the, the role of policy and the role of the private decision maker does vary on the context and how individuals view their incentives. This is important because I'm going to come back to this policy framework and the policy activities that have been outlined earlier. Uh, the other thing I'll note is that both India and China had a top, as a top uh, driver, a customer attraction and retention, which did not show up as one of the top four in the United States uh, or in Europe. So when, in, when asked what was their priority for reducing emissions, and you saw that up there, they the decision makers indicated the greenhouse gas emissions reductions was one of the drivers for them taking on energy efficiency. When asked what implementing approach they would take for, their, uh, for reducing emissions, energy efficiency in buildings was by far the largest winner. I will note, however, that 28% of those decision makers had not yet prioritized or did not know what their uh, what their top or leading uh, initiatives would be to reduce carbon emissions, which, which gives us lots of room to continue to educate and to con continue to engage with these decision makers on what types of approaches and technologies they could use. Another important area of the survey, and I'm walking through uh, just a couple of the key pieces, all of this can be found at our website, which is institutebe.com. Uh, another one of the important as aspects of the survey looked at what investments were being planned for 2010. Uh, and in, in summary, this slide paints a picture of an industry uh, and decision makers who are relying on their own capital to impact, to, to create opportunities and make investments. Uh, I'll go back to this, but I want to note that that's important because for companies like Johnson Controls who are in these markets uh, and for financial institutions who can provide capital into these markets, most of these decision makers are assuming they have to have the money in hand and that that is their clear, clear priority for how to make energy efficiency happen in their organizations. Uh, for ESCO businesses and for others, that has real implications. But I want to note here that there is, again, a global difference. Uh, in countries like India and China, that money needs to, they feel right now, is coming from inside. In countries like US and Canada, you see that there is actually a little more dis differentiation between whether that money has to be something that is in their own capital or operating budget. We were pleased to see in last year that, in fact, when we asked what impact has the recession had on your uh, levels of investment in the past 12 months, uh, that in fact it was a th there was a 56 percent of the respondents said that it has had no real impact, or they've invested the same or more in the past 12 months. In India and China, this this was not the recession wasn't help, help felt as uh, acutely as it was in the U.S. and in Europe. But 
uh, one of the important things that we saw was that there was indeed this bifurcation. The response to the recession and the economic conditions did not diminish energy efficiency interest globally, but it did create a bifurcated response. The most interesting slide to me in all of these is the, the slide that looks at what the barriers are. Uh, where are the barriers to investing in energy efficiency? Uh, and they came out to be four main things. Lack of capital budget, which we already talked about, for those individuals uh, and associations that were looking at making investments from their own finance, by fi self-financing, uh, that there was indeed this problem with finance. In the US and Europe, lack of capital was also a very important uh, part of the overall view of what was holding them back in making their energy efficiency commitments. Uh, in China, the number one barrier was an uncertainty around the savings or the return on that investment, not in terms of the financial investment, but in terms of whether and if the investments that were made would, could be benchmarked in terms of what they were, would perform, how they would perform, what, they would, what the individual was going to see out of it. There's a lack of certainty in the market, um, which really lends itself to a much greater look at energy management technologies with measurement and verification, doing baselining, looking at change over time, and then being able to follow through on the, uh, to, to prove that the measures were in fact saving energy. In India, the biggest barrier was a lack of technical expertise. Uh, decision makers felt that they did not have the ability to do an integrated review of the technology options that were available and how those technology options could be implemented effectively. So I think there in, in this slide we see that in fact there are a number of different areas where inst global institutions and global cooperation can work together to overcome market challenges that are being faced by decision makers around the world. And those are both in the capacity building context as well as in the financial financing context. This is a little slide that we use just to say, what, if you're thinking about this capacity building challenge, what are the pieces in it? And you'll see that uh, for us, we believe that there's a, a real need for uh, clarity around the product distribution, product channels, a need for our standards and codes that, that allow for clarity in the market, being doing labeling and allowing for uh, better transparency on the performance of technology and options, and the ability to measure, report, and verify in whatever framework is appropriate in those lo local circumstances, but it certainly is an important aspect uh, in order to move these markets forward to give confidence to the market that there are, in fact, uh, ways to look at how these uh, measures perform. I'm going to very quickly share with you our favorite uh, example of how you go in and think beyond a single measure approach. And this is the other thing that I, I'd like to leave you with, which is it's very important to do sta standards and codes on individual appliances. Uh, it's very important to look at specific lighting technologies, but we are missing the forest for the trees if we don't look at the overall integration of these technologies inside a building. Buildings are living systems and they require a constant review of the building level performance. This is one of the things that I think is important about GSEP. It's certainly one of the things that I think that, uh, that decision makers around the world have not yet figured out and we as building owners and managers in these decision makers still are grappling with all of the integration of these pieces. So in the, in the Empire State Building, which was an ESCO project that we worked on, sorry, uh, we worked first to reduce loads across the entirety of the building. Second, we upgraded the systems. So the first thing to do was get energy out of that, energy demand out of the building. The second was to upgrade the equipment. And the third was to install monitoring and controls so that you could constantly be watching what was happening in that building. And we worked very hard to make sure that the return on the investment met the owner's uh, key requirements in terms of payback period and in terms of the type of uh, overall outcome he wanted for this building. Uh, in this case, he was looking for a, a, a payback under three years and he had a renovation process that was going on, so there was ca some capital available already for the project. Uh, and he wanted to be able to upgrade the space at the Empire State Building in order to make sure that the, he was able to attract and retain the types of tenants he, would lo he was looking for for the building. Um, the goal was to, uh, to make both all of that happen, and we achieved a 38% energy savings uh, for $4.4 million annually in savings. Thank you.
Thank you, Jennifer, very much. Uh, you know, in transition, uh, as uh, I invite Russell uh, to come and, uh, and talk from his perspective, um, I have the opportunity to actually work in one of the world's most energy efficiency energy efficient office buildings, which is called the Research Support Facility at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is a greenfield example of what Jennifer just talked about in terms of a retrofit, where that building actually is lead platinum and will be zero net energy, including all of the uh, all of the uh, uh, computers, lighting, uh, there actually is no HVAC system in it because of, uh, of act adequate design, et cetera. And all built for the exact same cost or uh, nominal differences uh, relative to a Class A office building in the Denver uh, location itself. So I encourage uh, each of you to look that up on the website uh, if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, there are also a couple of articles in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times as well that have highlighted that recently. But it is an example of the systems approach and the, and the benefits that come forward and a real opportunity to change the dialogue, I think, going forward. But um, the, the financial aspect of that, I think, leads well into to what Russell's going to talk about as well. And I think uh, we'll... Uh, We'll just turn my mic over Thank to you. you. Thank you. Um, uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, last night when I was uh, putting together um, a presentation that I hoped would be interesting, um, I didn't display a lot of discipline in my slides. So my slides are going to be used in a very um, impressionistic manner. <laughs> Please bear with me. I think we'll have some fun and learn something. I've been in this business of energy efficiency for 30 years and have done it from the perspective of someone that ran an energy services company, someone that ran an NGO. And then I moved into IFC, the International Finance Corporation, about 10 years ago because I viewed it as a platform um, uh, not just to convene uh, and interface with the big companies of the world that, that have the means of moving things, but because at the end of the day it's about putting the cash in the right place. Uh, to make things happen. And, and so I'm going to reflect a bit on that. But I reflect, start with this, which is anyone that's looked at the complexity of carbon capture and storage will appreciate the elegance of this solution. And from this perspective, I really want to compliment and appreciate the Clean Energy Ministerial uh, for bringing to the forefront the most logical, appropriate first investment one makes, which is to leave the coal in the ground. Um, anyone that's sized a that that's looked at the economics of solar, wind, um, and uh, um, any advanced technologies at all uh, understands that you start by cleaning things up, plugging holes. Otherwise, the other stuff just isn't cost effective or feasible. So, just who is IFC? We are the private sector investment arm of the World Bank Group. We're the folks that don't deal with governments, we deal with the private sector. We share the same mission of eliminating poverty that the World Bank Group has, but we go about this through sustainable private sector economic development. Um, we do this with three different businesses. Uh, we invest money directly. We have an asset management company, which is um, a way that we leverage additional investment. And then the advisory services business, which has grown to over half of the people in IFC right now. And that's where I live. I lead, I lead the climate change business within advisory services. Um, IFC last year placed about $18 billion of investment um, for our own account. Um, and uh, in 103 countries. And our advisory services business was about a quarter of a billion dollars um, across all, all sectors. But I point out this big right chunk because this has become such a substantial part of our business. It's the business of investing in financial intermediaries, banks, whether we're investing equity in banks, inv providing um, credit lines to provide long-term capital in markets where liquidity is only available for very short periods, or a variety of different guarantees and instruments that push commercial financing into areas where it's not presently. I, our, our essential objective there is to deepen financial markets that allow markets to, to function more efficiently and for capital to flow where it's appropriate. So, our perspective here is climate change, and this has become a core pillar of what IFC is about. When I joined IFC, I was the kind of weirdo in the corner that was doing these energy efficiency things that weren't quite relevant to IFC's business. And every year in the annual report, we'd have sort of a poster child project, which was a windmill, which we shouldn't have been doing because it was so small that it was an inappropriate fit to what we do well. Now, climate change is a core pillar of our business. Sustainable energy is a major driver of our business. 
And what I do is try to keep track of it all because everyone's doing this stuff now in the, in the corporation. And the reason is we've got about $9 billion of various funding sources, public money to address climate change if you sort of aggregate all the various stuff of the clean energy ministerial and all their car cousins. And we got to get up there to about 175 billion. So how do you do that? You've got to mobilize the private sector. This has to work because people make money doing it. Otherwise, it just ain't going to happen except in our dreams. And it's not going to happen at a scale that really has any impact and we might as well say game over. So what's IFC trying to do? Well, um, by 2013, 20% 20 of our commitments, that is our investment commitments, will be for climate adaptation or mitigation projects. Um, and a significant part, this light blue uh, piece up here, and the green, and the top half really, is all about mobilization. It's IFC positioning itself to bring in co-funders, co-investors in projects. That's our mobilization, where we're syndicating investments and we're the lead investor. Others are putting their money behind us. Or also, as a vehicle for bilateral funding that's seeking to move a market. So increasingly, IFC is kind of the darling of bilaterals, agencies, um, that are looking for a way to not just provide a subsidy for something, but to put public money in a place that allows the market to go places where it hasn't been before because of the leverage and because of this previous slide right there. How do you get there? And you've got to figure out levers and vehicles that get other people to invest their money because they're going to make money. So our story is pretty impressive in the last four or five years where we've gone. This is our portfolio in renewable energy. It's gone from about $80 million to last year over $800 million. But more importantly, there's a lot more projects. So over 70% of our power business now is renewable energy in terms of number of projects. And the project sizes are smaller. So the amount of capital into those projects is at about 30%. But 70% of the transactions we did last year were renewable energy, energy efficiency, um, Why do we do this? A million dollars invested in new capacity will get you about a megawatt with conventional thermal power. If you invest that in energy efficiency, you'll get three to five megawatts equivalent. So if you're going to meet the yawning gaps of energy supply demand, and if you're going to address climate change by building more resilient, sustainable economies based on lower carbon input, this is where you got to go. So a lot of my challenge has been figuring out how IFC, which does really big transactions really well, gets capital into transactions which may be $500,000, $10,000. Why is that a relevant business for IFC? And so that has been where I put a lot of my energy and have been able to build a business in IFC. So the two feet you see at the top are these two economists having this conversation. And one of them saying to the other, Gee, George, why aren't you reaching down and getting all those dollar bills on the ground? And George says, well, if there were dollar bills on the ground, someone would have picked them up. So they're obviously not there. We must be hallucinating. This is the proverbial issue with energy efficiency, right? It's about behavior. It's about dysfunction in institutions. It's about market failure. It's about irrational human beings and human behavior, right? Why would a human being keep... Um, uh, money in the bank and get what 1% interest on your savings account when you can get a one or two year simple payback return by replacing the incandescent light bulbs in your house and the market failure leads to the kind of regulations and um, that we're seeing in the market right because of the greater social good so how do you awaken the sleeping giant of the marketplace such that you get rational investment happening well it's not as easy as saying, I'm IFC, I put money, I will go do money. My, if my tool is a hammer, my tool is money, it's, I can't get it done unless I'm looking at what is actually going on in that market. What are the barriers to it? So what are the tools that I wield most effectively? But this is also, and I challenge everyone who comes from different institutions here, you've got to think not just about what needs to be done, but what you are positioned to do well. So this has been part of the discipline in IFC, is not just understanding markets, barriers, but staying away from things we don't do well, which is that one little 
wind plant, which is $1 million, because our lawyers are going to swamp the sponsor. We've got to figure out a way to structure these things that play to our comparative advantage and use our convening power where needed. So this is how we look at it. This is basic S-curve where what you're trying to do is have penetration of an advanced technology, a compact fluorescent light, LED lighting, off-grid lighting, um, uh, cogeneration. And early stages where you're not proving out the technology, it implies certain types of interventions needed. Very often regulatory reform that creates, that, that knock down barriers. As the m technology matures, you start to get some volumes going. Um, you need standards, otherwise you can have market spoiling. Rick talked about the Lighting Africa program uh, and off-grid lighting, where the issue right now is that these products are finding themselves, finding themselves everywhere, and you're getting a lot of products that last about 10 minutes in the marketplace once people plug them in or try to use them because the batteries in them and the control systems are crap. And what you're going to have is the same kind of pushback situation you had with compact fluorescent lights in this country, where somebody finally got up the the, the, the bravery to go and buy one of these things for $15 and plug it in and it blew. And suddenly it wasn't, what is this product, who made it? It's those things don't work. And it became kind of conventional wisdom and I think it set back the uptake of the technology. It's critical at that moment that you start to have industry standards, a way that customers, clients, users can start to reference what is good, differentiate technology and create competition around quality and price at the same time by giving people in the intelligence they need. Market intelligence, how are these companies that currently are focused on LEDs for this little thing going to say, hmm, there's a market out there of people that are using kerosene and I have a technology that beats it, but I don't know anything about the market. I don't know what people desire, what they're able to pay for. I've got five minutes, I gotta move quick. Okay, and, and then at the up, upper end where markets are starting to move, how do you get capital to these people? And so this is the kind of construct that we think about. Industry standards, the efficient lighting initiative, we put the label on the box in this, in this um, project in seven countries. Ten years ago, the results have been immense in terms of scale up of compact fluorescent lights. This was in South Africa. The, the line at the top, interestingly, is not just showing that the market grew, but it's showing that there was replacement of incandescence because that was the incandescent bar at the top. So financial market development. Remember when I talked about how um, there's IFC is a misfit for um, doing these smaller transactions? And the question is, what is the problem there? When you look at why local banks were not lending for energy efficiency, it was a number of different things. First of all, the deal sizes fit very nicely, these banks. They're not very good for us. So I start to think, hmm, how can I get these banks to see this as a market? They don't have experience, so they're saying, we don't understand this asset class. We don't understand how to price loans to them. Are people going to pay us back? So we started supporting them by selling them risk-sharing tools because we were comfortable with the assets. Limited knowledge of the sector. We started working with them technical assistance to identify the segments of the market which fit their strategies. If they wanted to go down market into SMEs, how do you sell energy efficiency to SMEs? A ways to get to their strategy. And then the vendors and developers, good engineers, not so good at structuring transactions that a bank wants to finance. So working with them. What came out of this was a substantial IFC business, half a billion dollars last year, us providing credit lines, risk sharing tools to local banks to finance energy efficiency. One of these in China has the Chewy program, this immense impact. Our partner banks have lent $1.7 billion for energy efficiency in the last three years. GHG emissions associated just with the loans that we've provided guarantees for, 15 million. There's 100 countries on the earth that emit more every year than 15 million tons. And this project has reduced, avoided the emissions of that. The reality, though, is that there's still 1.6 billion people that live in the dark. And I'd just like to point out one thing. If you look at Africa, the West Coast, right there, Anyone know what that light is? Gas flaring in Nigeria. There's a problem. Another conversation. So when you start looking at who these people are, and you're looking at the, aid, the, the, the income pyramid, let's just look at the global market. About a billion people make about $26 million a year. Their total income is $25 trillion. But the low income, the lower two brackets, 
Five billion people representing four and a half trillion dollars of capital. So I start to think, these are the people that live like this. Is that not a market? In fact, they spend $38 billion a year on kerosene, which is 17% of the global lighting market. So you've got $38 billion for people that are getting 0.1% of actually the lighting service. So you've got a, an, an ethical issue here. You've got a market waiting to happen, and you've got superior technologies happening out there. This is the breakdown of that segment in Ghana and Kenya, where it's one and a half billion dollar market. So we asked, is this a market? If so, are there global and private local companies that have solutions to this? And are there commercial solutions? So I don't want to go out there and give five million dollars and give people lamps, and then that I've chosen sitting in my office in Washington, D.C. What I want is for a lot of people to make money providing a technology which saves people money and gives them better service. And that was the genesis of Lighting Africa. We actually, there was an emergence of technology, the LEDs, which allows you to package systems at less than a watt. You have business models such as Unilever starting to figure out how to sell to this market, things like shampoo where instead of selling them a five dollar bottle, you sell them a one rupee sachet, an affordable, you price things at a price point that's affordable, the lessons of this market, and went and talked to the LED industry. And these guys were selling scoreboards to stadiums, they were looking at putting more LEDs in a Cadillac, and they were looking at uh, blackberries. And we said, is this interesting to you? And they said, yes. We said, what do you need to start making products to go after this part of the market? They said, we need intelligence about the market, we need to understand what people will buy, how much they'll pay. We need protection because we need the junk out of there. We need people to understand the difference between quality and not quality and we need to figure out how people buy things. How, what is my distribution channel to someone that's currently buying kerosene off, off, off the grid? And so the Lighting Africa program addressed these things, regulatory reform, industry standards, market intelligence, and then the financial market development. How do you get the capital of these guys to scale up their businesses? This is essentially what we're trying to do. We're trying to bump up from the red S-curve of market penetration and trying to gain a lot of um, economic capital and rent and global benefits from the environment and quality of life improvements quickly by addressing those things and scaling it up. And you start to get all sorts of interesting, and I'm almost at the end, all sorts of interesting uh, partnerships come out of this. The telephone, uh, off-grid telephone market, I'm not going to tell the story. You probably have heard it, but it's astounding. It's the most impactful change I've ever seen in the developing world is the penetration of mobile phones. Not just because of what it does about communications, but because it's what it's doing about everything, including banking, where 30% of the GDP of Kenya now flows through mobile banking. One company, M-Pesa, right? All these innovations flowing out of this thing. And there's opportunities because they got the same problem that the lighting has, which is how you charge phones. And so we're starting to see products which address both telephones, and this is the driver. And by the way, people are getting lighting at the same time. And you, it's incredible the energy, the entrepreneurial genius that you're seeing emerge in these markets now. But it's driven by this technology. So it leads me to my provocative question. I, for a long time, have keep hearing about programs to do technology transfer. And I don't understand it. I just don't understand if the construct is you got technology in the United States and we have to put it in Nigeria, how does that work exactly? And, and I guess my lessons of learning is that's an academic abstract that doesn't fit how the world works. The world works through market development. And you start to see the kind of market in growth for mobile telephones, their annual growth of 60% in Africa. Um, and you start to see the infrastructure and the genius of what comes out of this. And this is M-Pesa, right? This is how people do business. It's through their telephones in Kenya. You buy something by zapping somebody the money from telephone to telephone, and that's how the economy works now. So as this happens, did Nokia take their technology and say, here, Kenya, we're Finns and we like to give you our technology? No. But what's emerged is a, a, an indigenous industry built around the technology that the Finns still own. But there's a lot of corollary and adaptive technologies that have emerged, including M-Pesa, which is 30% of the GDP flows through in Kenya. So that's 
my provocative observation from my conservative worldview, which is basically, let's let markets work if we want a sustained impact. And I'll leave you this one last image, which is we're out here ice fishing, right? And, and under the surface, there's, there's something brewing. This guy's got something on his hook. Not sure what it is. It's the market! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. With that, uh, if you can indulge us with a bit more time, uh, why don't we uh, to uh, go to some questions and uh, let me, if I could just repeat the, the ground rules, if you could please state your name, uh, your affiliation, and pose a question as a question. Uh, if it's to a particular panelist, uh, feel free to, uh, to target it in that direction. Uh, William Murray with the Energy Intelligence Group. Um, efficiency is it's kind of been in the in the news lately or talked about lately with a couple articles talking about the rebound effect and also uh, both in the New York Times and late last year in the New Yorker talking about the the Javon's paradox which is that the more efficient uh, economies get the more disposable income there then becomes to spend on more energy so that in the long term absent uh, carbon taxes there is actually no way to keep emissions from growing beyond what they were to start with. Um, how real is that problem, and have you come up with, uh, with solutions to that? Obviously, taxes are, carbon taxes are a real solution to that, but uh, in the 1980s here in the United States, we saw that rebound effect, and it's quite possible in the developing world that we may see that uh, coming shortly. So, so I, you know, this is a beautiful red herring, I think. The, the, here, here's the question. I mean, what is the question, right? Um, uh, innovation, improved technology, it's going to keep happening. And so that's a separate issue from do we need to do everything we can to make them more efficient. You know, it, the, the analysis that was in the New Yorker uh, that was um, referencing this that I think kicked off a lot of the local conversation. Um, it was as if all development in the history of mankind was a result of energy efficiency, not that there were parallel innovations. So I'm not sure what the question is. I mean, is it saying that um, we shouldn't concentrate on energy efficiency and therefore technological advancement will disappear? I, I don't get it. I think the issue is the issue they're trying to make is that the uh, moral arguments of, of climate change being solved through efficiency are, aren't possible, that there's a mutual exclusivity, and that, uh, that undermines, it does, it's not an economic argument. They're making a, a climate change argument that you won't actually see a decrease in efficiency. So when you bring up issues of how good it is both for economic development and climate change, in the absence of carbon taxes keeping controlling in the absence of carbon taxes. Yeah, I completely agree. I think we need carbon taxes out the wazoo. And the possibility in the developing world and of uh, a climate regime that would allow that in the next 20 years is? You're, 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 what? you're asking if there's governance that would allow that to happen? Yeah. Why don't we let the other two panelists respond and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll get them a bit more. I, my understanding is, and this is a statistic that I believe was uh, from an analysis that Trevor Hauser did, uh, uh, up in New York, uh, and I can get it for you, uh, was that the, his estimate economy-wide was that there wasn't a one-for-one -one correlation in terms of the emissions uh, savings for energy savings, that there was something around, you know, somewhere around 20 percent of a bump up in overall economic activity as a result of the freed up capital that was going into energy and is now being used to fuel additional economic activity and energy uh, consumption through that economic activity. Uh, in, in that, that's my understanding of the issue. You can tell me if I've got it wrong, but I believe that's where he ended up. The, the one thing that I'll say is that what we do through Johnson Controls uh, businesses is guarantee energy savings, kilowatt hours used. We're on the hook for those kilowatt hours used in a building. So if there was a rebound effect in that building, we would know about it. Uh, so whether that's displacing capital that goes into other macroeconomic tendencies that have an implication for emissions, that is a, a bigger issue. However, I would posit that that's not entirely negative and that there are ways of mediating uh, and mitigating that through some pricing mechanisms. 
But I do think that there's some interesting questions associated with what's the question you're asking. Can we track the reduction in energy consumption and demand when we put measures in place to reduce that energy? Yes, and we can guarantee it. For me, that's really the most important starting point for this argument. Just a, a, a quick comment on, on that particular article. There, there was a fundamental flaw in the article, which assumed that the, uh, all of the money that was saved 100 percent went into increased use of energy. So I'll pose a question to you. If you implement some savings process, uh, setting your thermostat to automatically go down at night, for example, or while you're out of the house, and it saves you $100, is that $100 going to all go into increased demand for energy? No, it's going to go to your entertainment budget. It's going to go to whatever it is you do in your lifestyle. Some of it might go into, well, I'm saving more money here, so maybe I'm going to make it a degree cooler in the summer, degree warmer in the winter. So some of it, some fraction, which is estimated at a few percent, will go to increased energy service demands, but broadly it's going to go to everything else that you do that's part of your economic activity. It's not one-to-one. -one. Great. I'll just add uh, one quick comment before we go to the next question, which is if you look at the international data that uh, Kateri, for example, put an example up uh, between the U.S. and Japan and you look at the overall energy intensity per GDP, uh, if you ask the income, of the income effect and the rebound effect among different economies, you can see pretty clearly that, um, you know, while the U.S. has a very strong um, average annual GDP, our energy consumption tends to be 30, 40, 50 percent higher than the average European who has a comparable uh, annual GDP of income and uh, more than twice uh, the average uh, Japanese, and so there's a, some interesting international comparisons there as well. Um, is there another question we'd like to turn to, if I could? Lawrence Jones with Austin Grid. I have a question for, well, for the panel in general, but especially Mr. Sturm. Uh, you talked about, um, when you started your presentation, you made mention about behavior change. And it, it seemed to me, uh, I haven't spent quite a bit of time in, in Europe and looking at this sort of a uh, appetite for efficiency from the standpoint of the customer. Uh, in the U.S., what, what do you think is the reason that energy efficiency, as it's being presented today, is a very, very good thing, and it should be a no-brainer for everybody? But apparently it isn't. So what behavioral change mechanism do we need in the U.S.? This is supposed to be the most sophisticated country in the world in terms of uh, educational standards, more or less. And so what's happening? Why is all this good stuff that's been done here not having any sort of a major impact in terms of how consumers are viewing energy efficiency? And if you just look at the price of gas, I think people get efficient here only when the prices go up. And that's when everyone starts to scale back. And as soon as the prices drop, then people start to consume in excess. So. What do we need to do to change what's happening in terms of the behavior in the U.S. in regards to energy efficiency? Thanks. I think you answered the question. I mean, we saw when gas was $4 a gallon, the metro was full, over full. It's, it's, we subsidize energy in this country. And, and the difference between Japan and Europe versus the U.S., you've seen the size, average size of a house of a well-off person in Europe versus a house in this country. And, and where those houses are located. We've built an entire economy based on um, subsidized gasoline. Subsidized, I mean the external costs are not embedded in the internal price because we don't tax it. That's personal view. Any other comments? Let me just uh, add a, another question or another comment to that. The other thing that I think happens for many companies at a corporate level on the energy efficiency investments that they're going to make, and in particular this goes back to where their many companies are seeking to finance this out of their own budgets. Um, and when you look at that, the choice then that any decision maker is making at a corporate level is do I invest in something that reduces cost or do I invest in something that might be a new product? And the difference is a bottom line versus top line prioritization. So if you're looking at all of the choices for investments, you're willing to take potentially a higher risk, lower guaranteed result in a, in a top line example than you might knowing that you're going to get a 9% savings on that investment, 10%, 15% savings on that investment in a bottom line 
uh, improvement to your business. So we, st we do see that there's sort of an, an, an asymmetry in decision making associated with how you will place your investments if you're thinking about a bottom versus top line opportunity. Thank you. Do we have a final question from the audience? Uh, it just, as long as you uh, briefly it, state brief. a question, we are yeah, running it's, it's quite brief. late, so, so thank you. So what needs to happen then? Uh, I, I heard what you said, but what, what do we need to do to change? Because based on what you've, what you've, you've presented here, I would, I would argue that maybe the developing world is where we have the best potential for real gaining in energy efficiency, globally speaking, than we have in, in the U.S., for example. So what, what has to happen? What's the solution? Well, I think, let me say to one example that I think is, um, is extremely compelling right now is uh, around a whole movement to take energy efficiency financing uh, and provide support through non-traditional financing mechanisms. In the U.S., we try to call this something called PACE, the Property Assessed Clean Energy. Um, in Melbourne, they're calling it an environmental upgrade assessment. Uh, they're allowing efficiency investments and improvements in buildings uh, to be financed on a bill that allows for you to make that investment and pay it back incrementally over time without having to either put it on your balance sheet or, or by uh, creating a disincentive because you may only own that building or hold that building for five years so therefore you're not interested in making long-term investments in it. So I think that that kind of a mechanism, looking at the structures that would free up decision makers to do the things that they're interested in doing, you saw the data, 85 percent of these managers are interested in energy and energy management because they believe that there are a lot of upside potentials for them. However, they don't have mechanisms right now that allow them to move that capital into those investments. That's why some of the programs that can allow for credit guarantees, that can allow for different mechanisms for them to access financing really can change the way that uh, the market will emerge. Um, I think with that, um, you've all been very generous with your time and uh, the panel has as well. I'd like to ask you to uh, join me in thanking the panel and, uh, and thank you all for your participation. Thank you.